I grew up in London, in Wimbledon. Actually, I grew up in Rains Park, between Wimbledon and Rains Park, a place called Wimbledon Chase. I was at, this is really odd, I was at the Scouts, you know, as a kid, and one of the Scouts who was like eight, two years older said, have you ever listened to Tommy? I didn't know what Tommy was. And he played me Pinball Wizard by The Who. And I sort of, wow, you know, discovered The Who, really. Except I had it wrong. I always thought Pete Townsend was Roger Daltrey and Roger Daltrey was Pete Townsend. I didn't know. And then I saw Woodstock at the cinema, which was 71. I was 14 and it came out. And, or maybe it was 70 or 13. I remember thinking, watching Joan Baez, and I was thinking, this is awful, singing Joe Hill and, you know, like reaching these high gospel notes. And then out of nowhere, there was this thunk, and it went boom, boom, boom. And it was Pete Townsend jumping. It was the sound of his guitar with echo. And the who came on. And I was like, wow. And that sort of, that was it, really. I start... Originally, I was doing fine art. I was going to be a painter. And I really, really want to go to art college. And went to art college and realized how much I hated it because it was, it was so pretentious. And what did it for me, the Who were playing three nights in London. And I queued up 11 hours to get tickets before you could get them online. And David Paul, who was the head of the Royal Society of Portrait Painters, in front of the class, called me in and said, what's more important, your drawing class or seeing this silly pop group? And I went, The Who? I'm, I'm going to see The Who. And I actually did, and I actually dropped out. That made me leave art college in the end, because, I mean, I hated it anyway. But while I was there, I'd picked up a Pentax camera, a Spotmatic, because they teach you a bit of everything. And I'd started going to shows. And I remember ACDC were playing at the Marquee on a Monday and a Wednesday, which were the slow nights. And I, I got to know them. I got to know Malcolm Young quite well. And I started sending him pictures to a paper. There was three papers in England. There was Melody Maker, Enemy, and Sounds. The edit, one of the editors at Sounds, which was the main paper, was a guy called Jeff Barton. And he wanted their things in England called an annual which I'm not sure if they have in America, and it would be like a yearly, you know, you'd have the Beano Annual, which was a cartoon of the best of the cartoons of the year. And he wanted, and they had to think, you know, various magazines had like, you know, the year in rock. And he came up with the idea of doing a magazine and calling it Krang, get it? Like a guitar Krang. And I thought it was really, really stupid. He said to me, what have you got in color? And we always shot in black and white then. I said, well, I think I shot half a roll of ACDC at Hammersmith. And he went, that will do. And that was back in black tour. And that became the first ever cover of Kerrang. And I suddenly realized because of the union fees, it was all unionized magazines, that instead of earning, say, $10 for a black and white, because it was color, they had to pay me 30. And instead of going to clubs in the north of England, I realized I could go and do UFO. I could go and do Aerosmith in America. I'm being generalizing. I could go and do Journey in Hawaii, which I did. And I suddenly, by default, became a rock photographer. And I sort of, in that sense, I started running Kerrang! because it paid me more, if I'm truthful. I ended up taking, by accident, the last picture of Bon Scott alive because I was out with Phil and Pete Way from UFO. And I can't remember where we were. I think we were at the music machine in Camden and Bon was there and Bon, if I'm really honest, was never very nice. I mean, he was not pleasant. Malcolm Young was nice. Bon was always, Nyeh. but he was older. And I said to Bon, do you want to do a picture? And he's like, no, mate, I'm not doing a bad one. And then Pete went, oh, come on, Bon, this Rossi's our mate, do a photo. And so I did about four, four frames and then Bon went, off for the night, the next day he was dead. So just by accident, I got the last ever picture of him alive and now Pete's dead. So in a sense, it's very poignant because that, you know, I started out shooting ACDC and I ended up, started out shooting UFO and I had the two main 
one of the two main principles and the last pic, you know, picture of Bond and the picture of Pete who's gone. Well, how I ended up as Metallica's photographer, Lars's favorite band or Metallica's favorite band is Iron Maiden. And they, he originally wanted Finn Costello because he loved Deep Purple and he did a shoot with Finn and there was no vibe between them. You know, he did a background with lightning on, you know, it looked terrible. And then I was second choice because I was Mr. Iron Maiden. Peter Mensch, who's, who was their manager, who is their manager at Q Prime, used to manage Queensryche. And he rang me up, I was doing Queensryche when they were sort of happening. And I was up in Seattle and he said, stop being an asshole and go to San Francisco and shoot my new band Metallica. And I would see pictures of Lars in Kerrang, which I'd never done, of like holding burning drumsticks was one. And he was like, oh, this geekish guy. And I'm thinking, oh, no. So on the way back from Seattle to LA, I stopped in uh, San Francisco and met Metallica. And the weirdest thing, they lived in this house in El Cerrito. And they had my posters on the wall, two of them, one of Motorhead and one of Michael Schenker of UFO. I was told to make sure the bass player changed his jeans so he's not wearing flares which was Cliff Burton, which I completely failed to do. But then I did them, and I was in Rocking Rio with Iron Maiden. We came to New York in January to play Radio City, and uh, Bruce Dixon got the flu, got really sick from traveling. And Metallica were there, and I ended up with them on the aircraft carrier in the harbor. It was the coldest day I've ever been out doing pictures. And I sort of started to do them after that on the Ride the Lightning tour. That's how I really met them and started shooting them. I used to get on with them. You know, they were fun to be with. The Black Album in black and white, I've done about, it's about my, it's my fourth Metallica book. But originally when we did the tour book, or I did the, the, I did the album, my idea was to do black and white portraits. And I remember when they did the album, they didn't credit me. I was, Lars actually rang me and said, we're not crediting anyone. And I was like, really? And I didn't really have an argument, even though I was pissed off, because he said, they're not crediting anyone. It's going to be a Led Zeppelin album, nothing. And then I saw Bob Rock's name and I found out Bob Rock nearly started crying and got his lawyer involved and they were gonna take his name off. So I was never credited for the portraiture on the album. I was really pissed off. When we did the tour book, if you see the original Black Album tour book, it's black and white at the beginning and in the middle it explodes into color from the shows. But the original idea was just black and white. But being, you know, Metallica at the time, they're very much into the show. They couldn't quite see that. So I wanted to do a book now as it's 30 years, that um, is in black and white. I even didn't like this cover. They love this cover, apparently. But now I like it, you know? I wanted it just to be the snake, but I think it, it's a negative. It works well. So we've just tried to pick, you know, I've tried to pick a good selection of what I like from the time. I mean, I could do a dozen different books on them without repeating pictures. But I just want to do something that sort of celebrates the Black Album, you know, that period of them. And I think this is the first time Metallica as a whole came into looking like a real band. You know, a real, going from like being a theatre band to a stadium act, you know, in the same sense of, you know, it's them. I think that's what this book shows, encompasses. Here's Van Halen. This is my Van, Edward Van Halen book. The first time I met Edward, they were opening for Black Sabbath. And I was at a party after the last show in London. And I wanted to get a picture of Brian May and Tony Iommi because they were friends. And as I was about to take the picture, I lined them up. Tony said, oh, I'll take a picture of my friend Edward. He's in the support band. And I was thinking, who is this guy? And then he wouldn't leave. I'm thinking, why don't you like just go away? Seriously, like fuck off, you know? And he wasn't going anywhere. And if you look, he's got a big pin that says Van Halen. And he was there all night. And he said, oh, did you shoot us? And I said, your PR wouldn't let me. And then they came back to London about three months later for their first ever headline show. And I got a phone call and it was, hey, it's Ed. I'm like, Ed who? Edward. 
He said, we, we're playing London tomorrow. Are you going to come and shoot? He wrote my number down. And this is where that picture was taken on the cover. And they did their first headline show, which was at the Rainbow Theatre in London, 1979. So when he died, I thought, someone said, why don't you do a Van Halen book? And I was like 50, 50. I thought, you know, I should. You know, I have so much. So I've done it and I've tried to keep it fairly chronological. You know, I've got the very first time I saw them opening for Sabbath all the way through. Here's the, here's the Black Sabbath party. You can see it. And I've even got, you know, I've put every line up and ended with Gary Sharon, you know, even through the Hey Guy years to everything. So, you know, I liked Ted, but he was always really great to me. So that's the idea of this book. What do you remember about shooting with that? Pain in the ass because when I shot Zeppelin, I took some at Earl's Court, but that was from the audience as a fan. And then I shot them in Nebworth uh, on the second show they did. And I was with Chalky Davis, another photographer who I always liked, who worked for the NME. And Chalky and I climbed the scaffolding. You know, they were miles away. And this video guy ran up to us and said, what are you doing up there? And we said, oh, Peter Grant said it was okay. He went, oh, all right then. And we shot the show. And I remember before the show, we met BP Fallon, who was their PR, who was on speed. And he was buzzing. And we said, oh, can we do a group shot? And he went, sure. And we went in the dressing room and shot them. They just lined up for us. I was amazed. You know, they just lined up in front of us. They were very friendly. And we shot them both there. And Chalky and I had the shots. I see all these books and I would always see these books where you'd see the greatest rock album covers ever and it'd always be on the cover would either be um, Sgt Pepper or The Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. So I thought, you know, Led Zeppelin only released nine records, I think, yet there's two and a half thousand official releases on LP and you know, there's all the bootleg vinyl. So I wanted to, I collect it. And so does Jimmy Page. So this book really is a representation of myself and Jimmy Page's record collection. And it's really, I wanted just to make an affordable art book that's not, that doesn't cost a thousand dollars that you can go in or online and buy. And, you know, people who look at it, kids and stuff can, you know, there's a bit of everything for everyone in here, I hope, you know. And I remember buying this when it first came out in Virgin Records in England. It's called Live on Blueberry Hill. And it was recorded at the Los Angeles Forum. And it sounds really cavernous, but it's an amazing show. And the very first Led Zeppelin bootleg was this. And it's from Vancouver, March 1917. It was only pressed in Seattle on this brown cover. And it's called Pure Blues. And it's a radio broadcast, but what I didn't know, whoever did this was very clever. If you do physics, this is the atomic sign for lead. So if you uh, want to do chemistry or something, you would know that. I never knew that. Someone pointed it out, PB. So um, it's got some unusual, you know, oddities in it, which I actually like. This, which I love, and it's the only one that I... That anyone's found that even Jimmy said to me, what are you doing with that? I said, keeping it. And it's from Vietnam. It's Led Zeppelin one, even though it looks like a four and it looks like a jazz album. It's on red vinyl on the Al Chow label. I think you say, and it's from Vietnam, 1969 or 70. And it was pressed for the U S troops who were fighting in Vietnam. So it's really unusual. So I've got the only copy, I think. I've got this one that's in here. So anyway, that's, my, that's the vinyl Led Zeppelin. Never. I would never plan for a shoot. Eddie, if I ever planned for a shoot, it would go wrong. I always turn up. I sort of know what backgrounds I'm going to use and what light I would like to use. But I never think, right, I'm going to do this. Because it never... I always get the vibe when I get there and work from there. You know, I have an idea whether I'm gonna shoot color, black and white, or my idea of a shoot is to always shoot something that, and that if you saw a magazine on a stand, you'd stop and look at it. That is my mentality to a photograph. 
So if you're walking in an airport and you're looking at a magazine rack, that picture will make you go and pick up the magazine. That's my idea of a shoot. Okay, the one of them live, I think it's from Milton Keynes above London. I'm not sure actually, but I just like the synchronicity of the two of them. It's a picture I've never published before. It's in the book. And it, I just like, I just think that picture sums them up live. You get the energy and the force of what they're pushing out, you know, or transcending. Is that the right word? You know, with Metallica, I quite like it. You know, Lars will say, come up, you know, when they're doing a big stadium, I'll go up behind him as he comes on because you'll get the energy of the crowd and it coming or some pyro. But generally, I, I never take that picture. But I got into the thing where people say, oh, you just wander around the stage. I don't. I normally only will only go up during the encores when I think the band, the energy's right. And I'm good at reading people. I mean, I don't just walk up the Hetfield and go like this. I can read whether he's all right with me being there. The same with Lars, the same with Kirk, and the same with Rob Trujillo. I can read the energy of it. And you've got to watch your things like video people, stuff going on. I'm good at that. It's something I've become good at, I suppose. That picture there is my favorite picture of Metallica of all time. That was about 3 or 4 a.m. on the jet. Time Warner gave us a jet. Well, didn't give us. It was the first time we'd all been on a private plane. And it took us from London to Moscow, Moscow to London. It was the Black Crows and Metallica shared it. And they were rather the worse for wear, shall we say. And if you look at the drummer's finger, he'd whacked it on the snare, hit it with his stick on the snare drum and it had bled, which is as he's slightly, in, well, he's not slightly, as he's very intoxicated, so's Kirk and he's um, offering him some assistance. And James is, coming in, but he's wearing Johnny Colt's hat of the Black Crows. And I remember on that plane, James, there was a case of beer left and James sat on it and wouldn't give it to anyone else on the plane. But I just like that picture because you'd never get that now. The picture you see of Jimmy Page there was um, done in London. And Jimmy hates, hates to have a picture of himself smiling. He has this very set view of looking very hard. And that was frame 36, it was the last frame on a roll of film, and it's frame 36A. And I literally said something that made him laugh, and he tried to, as you can see, his eyes shut because he's trying not to laugh. And I made him laugh, and I got one frame. And that picture is actually in the National Portrait Gallery in London as you walk in. So I'm very pleased. That's my favorite picture of him. And I love the fact it's in the National Portrait Gallery in London. It's sort of like, I've made it, I'm in the Portrait Gallery. That I just like because I love Chris Cornell and he was a good friend of mine. And that was taken in Los Angeles, the Sunset Marquee Hotel, and in one of the rooms. And I just like the fact he's like, I think he's, they used to call them Frown Garden, Sound Garden, but they're not miserable at all. They're quite the opposite. And I just like that picture because it's naturally, you know, I got him to laugh. He's always, we always joke, you know, he's laughing about something. And I just think it really shows the real Chris Cornell to me. If I, I'm going to do a book on him and that is going to be my book cover. I love that picture. Ozzy, John Osborne. Well, that is in White Sands, New Mexico. And we'd gone out for the day they were filming. And they'd gone to this, they'd taken this place called Hatch Chili, where they make chilies. And by the time they got to White Sands, it was like three hours later than they were meant to. And he was like, you can fuck off. I'm not doing it. I said, come on. He goes, fuck off. No. I said, I've been here for hours. I don't care. No. And I remember he was in, Kelly Osborne was driving like a camper van he was in. And they'd all gone to look at where they're trying to shoot. And it was nearly dark, as you can see, and it would got there was a storm coming and I made him walk up this sand dune and he goes, I'm fucking not doing it. And I was taking a light reading and I heard this sound. And as I looked round, he had a harmonica out of his pocket and he was playing The Wizard by Black Sabbath. And I was like, wow. And I took a picture. I've got a colour shot of him standing there being blown by the wind doing The Wizard. And I was like, I've got Ozzy playing The Wizard for just me and him. And I got about three frames of him and he goes 
fuck it, that's it, I'm not doing it, and walked back down the sand dune, and that was it. But I got this one shot, and I actually like it because you can't quite see it's him, but you can see it's him when you look. And I just like the tone of it and everything. Plus, he played the wizard for me. Billy Gibbons, that was at the Sunset Marquee. And I was doing, I ended up for the hotel shooting everybody who stayed there. And the idea was around the hotel to have portraits of people, but my concept was have portraits of them in the hotel. And so I would shoot Chris Cornell in the hotel. I would, sh I've shot, I shot Ozzy when the, they, were, they were doing construction. And I shot, and I said, I was meant to do Gibbons because he all stays there. I said, so Billy turns up in that car. And I like the car because it looks like something out of Frank Sinatra or the mob or something out of, you know, Ocean's Eleven. It looks like it's from the 50s. Even the car probably is. I just like the look of the whole thing, the awning and everything. And it's become one of my most famous pictures of Billy Gibbons, really. It's shot in 6-7, large format film. I was one of the last people to go to digital because I always thought, you know, I'm the purist, man. I'm going to shoot film. And truthfully, digital color is way better than film color. And I fought it till the end. But digital black and white cannot touch film. If I can, I'd still prefer to shoot black and white film. Six, seven, 35 mil. It's... Um, it just looks like film. You know, digital black and white does not look like film. I remember doing the Foo Fighters in Anaheim in LA, and I thought, oh, I just, just went for that when Dave Grohl had broken his leg and he'd have thrown, and I just shot black and white film. And it was really weird, whereas before, I could in the dark just change film without thinking. When it, <laughs> at the end of the 36 frames, I was like, I can't see, you know, what am I doing? You know, I was so used to digital that it took a while to get back to it. You know, I still like to shoot film if I can. Do I feel misunderstood? I think everybody thinks I'm difficult to deal with. And I don't think I'm difficult to deal with. I'll give you a perfect example of it. I had to shoot Pearl Jam for a cover of a UK magazine. And it was quite an important magazine. And I was told I had an hour. And I had to drive in with the lights and a background to do it into central London. And when I got there, the PR was waiting and they looked, and it was a young guy, he looked really nervous. He said, can we do this a bit quicker? And I said, how quicker? And he said, you've got four minutes. And I went fucking mental. I mean, I was screaming at him. And then Veda came out the lift and they were all like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I ended up, I was so livid with anger. I was shooting on a large format camera. We had them in Hyde Park behind the hotel. And I, I think I shot two rows, I said, we're done. And literally around them was, and I'm not making this up, at least 35 people. There was like five bodyguards, six PRs, record company people. I mean, this whole, I was surrounded with it. And I just did the picture, said, fine, we're done. And then Ed came up to me, said, what's going on? And I said to him, I'm sick of this. He said, if I wanted to take orders, I'd join the army and I'm not in the army, okay? And he, said, and he said, what's going on? So I said to him, told him what happened, and he, and he made everyone wait, and he said, what do you wanna do? I said, let's do some solo stuff. He said, absolutely. And everyone's super pissed off, but no one would say anything to him. And he was wearing a Who t-shirt, and I got a picture of him inside doing this, like smiling in a Who t-shirt, grinning. And I remember they had this big thing about you can only give out group shots. You can't do this, can't do this. And I remember selling it to Rolling Stone. I've sold it everywhere. But there is no reason to be like that. I mean, I am not difficult to deal with. If you tell me I have four minutes up front, I'll deal with four minutes. But if you tell me I've got an hour and it becomes four minutes at the last minute, then I will be difficult. It's common decency and common courtesy. And in this business, a lot of people think photography is so disposable, which is probably the digital age, and everything's so disposable. And they think, you know, when you get security going like, you know, threatening you, I'm like, do it. I'd love to retire. I'll put you out of business and your act. Smash me senseless. I don't think I'm difficult. I'm very 
black and white, if you're all right to me, I'm perfectly okay to you. You know, I will, I will work in the parameters you want me to as long as you're straightforward with me. It's when you're not straightforward with me, I will be difficult. So you tell me whether I'm misunderstood or difficult. You know, you can answer that. What do I enjoy about taking pictures? Let me think of an example. Taylor Hawkins from the Food Fighters, you know, much like, much like Mench originally said, hey, asshole, come and shoot my studio with my band. And he's got a band with Dave Navarro and Chris Chaney. And I went out there and it's like way out in, L in suburbia, in LA, in Calabasas. And I had a really good time shooting them. And I thought that's what I enjoy. And I shot the Black Crows at the LA Forum and I hadn't shot them for 11 years, I didn't realize. And I really enjoyed the show and really enjoyed seeing them and really enjoyed shooting them. And when that all happens, or all the lines, you know, it's trying not to be too spiritual, you realize this is what I do. And it's exciting, it's fun, it's enjoyable, you know, it's great.